Hi folks, uh, today's video is about the Chebyshev polynomials and um, the Chebyshev polynomials are functions from the interval from negative 1 to 1 uh, to itself, so, so from, from that interval to itself. In other words, they take uh, x values from negative 1 to 1 as inputs and the output is also a, a, a value from negative 1 to 1. The definition does not look like a polynomial, but I will convince you that it is in fact a polynomial, but I'll do that later. The uh, briefest definition is to say that Tn of x is equal to cosine of n times uh, inverse cosine of x. n can be any natural number, right, meaning 0, 1, 2, etc. And so the, the uh, Chebyshev functions are actually a family of functions. Um, one for each n, and they're given by this definition in terms of cosine and inverse cosine. Okay, um, so I will convince you later that it is actually a polynomial, but first of all, let's just think about basic properties of this function. So uh, here's the picture over here. We got the, the diagram. Um, the input is x, right? So that's a point on the x-axis. I've drawn the unit circle here because we're going to work with the uh, uh, cosine function, right? so it's convenient to have the unit circle. So the way the uh, Chebyshev function works, or Tn, is that uh, you take the x value, you project that x value up to the unit circle to find the uh, corresponding angle. So this angle theta here is the angle that corresponds to x in the sense that cosine theta equals x, or arc cosine of x equals theta. Uh, yeah arc cosine meaning inverse cosine. So okay, so the way this works is then uh, once you've got the angle theta, then you multiply the angle theta by n, right? So take theta, multiply by n, go over here to n theta, and then you take the cosine of n theta, so you look up the corresponding x value for that angle, n theta. And that is the output, right? So that's the value of tn of x. It's the x value that corresponds to n times theta, where theta corresponds to the input x value. Um, so it's, it's kind of an odd combination of you know, at, um, uh, points on the x-axis, then projecting onto the circle, multiplying by n, then projecting back onto the x-axis. Um, because it's defined in terms of the cosine function, it's very easy to um, uh, identify certain properties of the function. For example, we can easily identify where the function is zero. Uh, this function will be zero when the cosine uh, is zero. And uh, for convenience, again, let, let's write theta uh, for the uh, uh, angle corresponding to the input x value. So theta is inverse cosine of x. Then we can say that um, this is going to be equal to zero when cosine of n theta equals zero. Now we know when uh, cosine is equal to zero. Cosine is equal to zero when the angle is of the form pi over two plus k pi, where k is any integer, right? A whole, a whole number, a negative whole number. Um, so solving for theta, divide both sides by n, um, then that means that uh, tn will be zero when theta is of this form, or in other words, of this form, right? So when the angle is uh, basically pi over 2n plus uh, some even multiple of uh, 2 pi k over 2n. So as an example, when uh, n equals 0, there are no zeros. Because when n equals 0, this is just cosine of 0, and it's just identically 1. It's just the constant function. It's always 1. When n equals 1, then uh, this is just the cosine of the cosine inverse of x, so you just get x back, right? The uh, uh, function applied to its inverse function just gives you the identity function. And so tn of x equals x, and that's equal to 0 when x is equal to 0. Uh, x equals 0 corresponds, of course, to um, uh, theta equal to pi over 2, right? When you're at pi over 2, then x is 0. Um, when n equals 2, then uh, these angles are of the form pi over 2n or 3 pi over 2n, right? where n is 2, so that would be pi over 4 or 3 pi over 4. And so um, uh, taking the cosine of those angles gives you the x values that make uh, the Chebyshev function 0, so that would be plus or minus 1 over radical 2. 
right? If the x value is corresponding to pi over 4 and 3 pi over 4 over here. In general, for any n, there are always exactly n zeros of this um, Chebyshev function Tn, and the zeros are always of this form, right? So basically, it's pi, you start off with pi over 2n, and then you do all the odd uh, numerators, right? 3 pi over 2n, 5 pi over 2n, all the way up to 2n minus 1 pi over 2n, right? Uh, those are the angles, and then the, the actual x values that represent the zeros of the function are the cosine of those angles. Uh, another important feature of Tn are where it takes its max and min values and what those max and min values are. Well, since Tn is basically equal to, uh, to this function, cosine of n theta, where uh, we understand that theta is cosine inverse of x, um, cosine function uh, is, is bounded by plus or minus 1, right? So the, the max and min values of Tn will also be plus or minus 1. And the cosine function takes those max and min values when the input, when in this case n theta, is equal to a multiple of pi. So k pi, uh, again, where, where k is uh, any integer. Um, so, so the uh, max and min points are going to be when theta is equal to 0, or pi over n, or 2 pi over n, etc., all the way up to pi. Um, those are the only va uh, uh, theta values that correspond to x values between negative 1 and 1. So although there are infinitely many k values, right, which means there'd be infinitely many um, possible values of theta, these are the only ones that correspond to x values between uh, negative 1 and 1. So they're the only ones we're concerned with. Um, so what you can see here is that uh, it, this function Tn takes its max and min values uh, exactly n plus 1 times, right? Starting from 0, pi over n, all the way up to n. There's actually n plus 1 different uh, values here where, where cosine n theta takes its maximum values. Um, another way to put it is that Tn takes its max absolute value exactly n plus 1 times. Okay. So here's a graph of T7. This is the uh, Chebyshev function of order 7. It has exactly 7 zeros right along here. It has exactly 8 min and max points, right? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. And it has exactly six changes of direction, right? Six bumps in it. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, so you'll notice that even though I have not yet proven that uh, Tn is a polynomial, it does behave just like a polynomial of degree seven, right? A polynomial of degree seven, you would expect to have exactly seven zeros, um, and you would expect it to have six bumps in it, right? Six changes of direction. That's the way polynomials work. So let's prove that it really is a polynomial. So uh, first, let me review a little trigonometry that we'll need in order to, um, to uh, show that Tn is a polynomial. Um, I'm going to do it by way of Euler's formula, which you've probably encountered by now. It's, uh, it says that e to the i theta equals cosine theta plus i sine theta, and i is this um, sometimes mysterious seem seeming number, the square root of negative 1, right? i squared equals negative 1. But this is a very famous formula. You've almost certainly seen this somewhere. But I'm going to use this in order to, to um, derive the identities we need. The great thing about Euler's formula is that it makes it so easy to derive a slew, a veritable slew, of trig identities. So for example, um, we can get uh, angle addition formulas using or Euler's formula. Uh, we say that uh, suppose we're interested in cosine of alpha plus beta, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to add i times sine of alpha plus beta, right? And we're going to try to figure out formulas for the trig functions of alpha plus beta. Well, according to Euler's formula, this expression on the left is equal to e to the i times alpha plus beta. According to the rules for powers, this is equal to this. It breaks up into uh, two factors, e to the i alpha times e to the i beta. Then, applying Euler's formula again to each one of these factors, e to the i alpha is equal to uh, cosine alpha plus i sine alpha, and e to the i beta similarly is equal to cosine beta plus i sine beta. 
And then what we do is we just multiply this out, right? So we just expand it algebraically, keeping in mind, of course, that i squared is equal to negative 1. And then it, uh, multiplying it out and then regrouping it with the uh, real terms on the left side and the imaginary terms on the, on the right side over here, we get this. Now, by setting the, re uh, the real and imaginary parts of the original expression equal to the real and imaginary parts of the uh, final expression we just obtained, we get two formulas, one for the uh, cosine for, for, of alpha plus beta and one for the sine of alpha plus beta. So the, the real parts on the left side, cosine of alpha plus beta is equal to this, uh, cosine alpha, cosine beta minus sine alpha, sine beta. So that's this, this guy here, the cosine uh, angle addition formula. That's the one we'll actually need because uh, Chebyshev's function uses cosine. Um, but incidentally, we also get a formula for this uh, angle addition formula for sine by setting the imaginary parts equal to. So on the left side, the imaginary part is sine of alpha plus beta. And on the right side, it's this uh, cosine alpha sine beta plus cosine beta sine alpha. Okay, so I'm going to use this formula on the next slide in order to derive um, an important formula that, that we'll use. But for the moment, let me continue on playing with Euler's formula. And uh, I want to derive what's called DeMoss formula. So uh, DeMoss formula um, is a formula not for the sum of two different angles, but for a multiple of one angle. So what we'll do is we'll apply Euler's formula to the case where we, we simply replace theta by n theta. Right? So replacing theta by n theta, we get cosine n theta plus i sine of n theta equals e to the i times n theta. Now again, what we do is we apply the rules for powers here, and we say we can rewrite this expression as e to the i theta, then raised to the nth power. Now we can apply... Um, Euler's formula again to the inner term inside the parentheses, e to the i theta is cosine theta plus i sine theta, but now that's all raised to the nth power. So the most formula is actually this part. It says that uh, cosine n theta plus i sine n theta is equal to cosine theta plus i sine theta raised to the nth power. Um, expanding this term, we get uh, you know, applying the uh, uh, rule for uh, binomial expansion, right, which you probably learned in high school, we're going to get the first term raised to the nth power. Then we're going to get n times the first term raised to the n minus first power times the second term. Right, so I've written that here. Then we get the uh, well, n choose 2 is the next coefficient times the first term raised to the n minus 2 power plus i sine theta squared. Remember that i squared is negative 1, so this becomes negative and so on like that, right? So for example, just I'll just do one more term. The next term is gonna be uh, cosine to the n minus three. The coefficient out front will be n choose three. And then we're also gonna multiply by i sine theta to the third power. i cubed would be negative i, so that's where this comes from, negative i uh, times times this, and so on. Now I'm running out of space here, so all I'm going to do is set the uh, real parts of each side equal. That's what I need for the uh, Chebyshev function. So the real part of the left side, or the original left side up here, was cosine n theta. The real part of this expression that we ended up with down here, it starts off with cosine to the n of theta, right here. Uh, the next term is imaginary, it's got an i in it, so we skip that. The next real term is this, minus n choose 2 times cosine to the n minus 2 times sine squared. Uh, the next term is going to be imaginary, we'd skip that. And then the, the, the next real term would be n choose 4 co cosine to the, uh, uh, n minus 4 of theta times sine to the fourth of theta, and so on. The sines are going to alternate. The powers of cosine go down by 2 each term and the powers of sine go up by 2 each term, right? And you just continue that until you, you run out of uh, n, right? n goes down to 0. Um, so uh, uh, what we can do here, because sine is always raised to an even power, right? There's no sine in the first term, then we have sine squared, then we have sine to the fourth. Because of that, we can re uh, replace sine uh, with, with an equivalent expression in cosine. So 
sine squared we can replace by 1 minus cosine squared, right? That's a, a basic trig identity. When you have sine to the fourth, we can replace that by 1 minus cosine squared, which is sine squared, all squared, giving us sine to the fourth. So what we've done here is we've expressed cosine and theta completely in terms of cosine of theta, right? Powers of cosine of theta. Now remember that cosine theta, that was our x value, that, that was our, our x which was the input to Chebyshev's function, right? So we said theta was uh, cosine inverse of x, or x equals cosine theta. So wherever you see a cosine uh, theta here, you can replace it by x. So this first term gets replaced by x to the nth power. Here we get x to the n minus 2 times 1 minus x squared. Here we get um, x to the n minus 4 times 1 minus x squared squared, right, and so on. So now you can see that this expression over here can be completely expressed as a polynomial in x, right? It's entirely a polynomial in x. And on the other hand, this thing that we're evaluating here, cosine of n theta, that is exactly the value of the Chebyshev function tn of x. So we've shown that tn of x is equal to this polynomial in x, right? So this verifies what I promised you, that tn is in fact always a polynomial for any n. So now I want to do the triple recursion formula. Uh, recursion, you know, in general is when you express uh, a function in terms of a simpler version of the function. This is called the triple recursion formula because it expresses a function in terms of two simpler versions of the function. Uh, and we get it by using this, this cosine addition formula that we derived on the previous page. So I'm going to use this one. I'm also going to use the version where we replace beta by minus beta. So if you replace beta by minus beta, you get cosine of alpha minus beta. Replacing uh, cosine beta by cosine minus beta actually makes no change at all. Cosine is an even function, so cosine of minus beta is still cosine of beta, so I don't have to make any change here. However, when I replace sine beta by sine of minus beta, uh, sine is an odd function, so sine of minus beta is minus sine of beta, and therefore this sign changes, right? So that's why I have a plus sign here, the two negatives cancel. So this is the, it's the angle difference formula for cosine. So we'll, we'll use both of these. So first of all, uh, consider t sub n plus 1 of x. Well, by definition, this would be cosine of n plus 1 times theta, where theta is you know, uh, uh, inverse cosine of x, right? Well, n plus 1 times theta can be thought of as n theta plus 1 extra theta, so I'll write it like that. In this form, you can see how now we can apply the cosine addition formula. So we do that, apply the cosine addition formula here, and we get this expression. Now we do a similar thing with t sub n minus 1. t sub n minus 1 of x would be, by definition, cosine of n minus 1 times theta, which you can think of as n theta is minus 1 theta, right? And then now to this, we can apply the angle difference formula, and we get this formula. Now, the trouble is that both of these formulas have these uh, um, sine expressions in them, right? Sine of n theta times sine theta. And uh, we don't really want sine here because that has nothing to do with the uh, uh, Chebyshev function. However, the great thing is that when we add up this one plus this one, those uh, sine terms will, will cancel each other out. One is positive, the other is negative. So we'll be able to cancel them out. Uh, so what we get is that when we add tn plus 1 of x plus tn minus 1 of x, we just get two copies of this cosine term, right? So we get 2 cosine n theta times cosine theta. And now, uh, having gotten rid of all these signs, these can be expressed in terms of um, uh, the original input x and the value of uh, Chebyshev's function. So cosine theta... That corresponds exactly to x, right? So we can put that here. And cosine n theta, well, that corresponds exactly to tn of x. We get tn plus 1 of x plus tn minus 1 of x equals 2 times x times uh, tn of x. 
uh, solving for tn plus 1 of x, right, bringing this term over on the right, we get this formula. This is the triple recursion formula. It says tn plus 1 is equal to 2x times tn minus tn minus 1, right? So we've, we've expressed tn plus 1 in terms of the two previous, the two simpler Chebyshev functions, tn and tn minus 1. So if we know that the previous two, we can figure out the next one. So now what we'll do is apply the um, uh, original definition of the Chebyshev polynomials and the triple recursion formula to write down the first uh, five of them, okay? And, and you'll see how you can generate as many as you want. So um, using the original definition here, uh, t0 of x is just equal to cosine of n times cosine inverse of x. Well, if n is 0, this is just cosine of 0. And cosine of 0 is just, just the constant 1. So t0 of x is just a constant function 1. Uh, I'll also use the original definition for t1 of x. t1 of x would be cosine of uh, 1 times cosine inverse of x. So that's just cosine of cosine inverse. So the function and its inverse cancel each other out. We just get x, right? So t1 of x is just x. Starting from t2, we'll be using the uh, triple recursion formula which says that uh, tn plus 1 is equal to 2x times tn minus tn minus 1. So for t2 of x, we can say that's equal to 2x times the previous Chebyshev function minus the one before that, which was just 1. So 2x times x minus 1, just 2x squared minus 1. That's t2. Um, I'll do this a couple more times, applying the, the triple recursion formula, t3 of x would be equal to 2x times the previous Chebyshev function minus the one before that, which was x. So you multiply this out, expand it, simplify, you get 4x cubed minus 3x. So that's the third Chebyshev function. And one more, the fourth Chebyshev function, that would be 2x times the previous one um, minus the one before that, which is this. So do the algebra, you get 8x to the fourth minus 8x squared plus 1. Okay, so you can go on doing this forever, of course, and you could write a, um, a MATLAB function that would generate the um, coefficients for the uh, Chebyshev polynomials and, and all that kind of thing. It, it's a reasonably easy algorithm to follow. Uh, let's just summarize a few important facts about the Chebyshev polynomials. So tn is of degree n, and it has uh, exactly n distinct zeros, right? It has no double zeros. So of course, a, a degree n polynomial always has n zeros. But uh, important to note that the Chebyshev polynomials al always have distinct zeros. So they always have n distinct zeros. Also, the absolute value of tn takes its maximum, which will always be 1, at exactly n plus 1 distinct points. That turns out to be another important fact. Uh, one thing that, that seems to be developing here is that uh, tn is an even function when n is even, right? So t0 is just 1, t2 was 2x squared minus 1, it only had even powers of x. t4 was 8x to the fourth minus 8x squared plus 1, again, only even powers of x. So it seems that for even n, um, the Chebyshev function is an even polynomial, and uh, when n is odd, uh, it seems that the Chebyshev function is an odd polynomial, it only has odd powers. That's actually pr pretty easy to verify from the triple recursion formula, right? Because you multiply x, this 2x times the previous um, polynomial, uh, which changes it from even to odd or odd to even, and then we uh, subtract off the one before that, which will always have the same parity, even or odd, as the current, as the current one, n plus 1. And so it's pretty easy to verify that, that uh, this is, in fact, true in general. And uh, one other thing is that uh, you'll notice that starting from, from n equals 1, the uh, leading coefficient is always a power of 2. So this is 1 times x. Here it's 2 times x squared. Here it's 4 times x cubed. Here it's 8 times x to the fourth, right? So the co coefficients go 1. Uh, 2, 4, 8. It always seems to be a power of 2. In fact, the leaning coefficient is always 2 to the n minus 1. Um, by the way, by the leaning coefficient, I just mean the coefficient of the highest power of x, right? So the leaning coefficient is, is the, the 
the coefficient of the leading term. Um, th this is pretty obvious from the examples that we did, but it arises because of this factor of 2x and the triple recursion formula, right? Every time you apply the triple in, uh, recursion formula to get a new Chebyshev function, you're always multiplying by an extra power, uh, uh, well, extra factor of 2. Right? So, um, that turns out to be an important property also for us. So now I'm going to define a slight modification of the Chebyshev polynomial and then show that this slightly modified version has an important optimality pro property that's actually quite relevant to us in doing a polynomial interpolation. So we're going to define uh, T tilde uh, of n to be Tn divided by 2 to the n minus 1. So basically all we're doing is we're dividing out that leading coefficient of 2n minus 1 that we just saw that Tn always has. By dividing out that leading coefficient, that means that the leading term in T tilde n is simply going to be x to the n. Right? So the leading coefficient will always be 1. Uh, a polynomial like that, whose leading coefficient is 1, is called a monic polynomial. Okay? So monic meaning 1. Right, so in, in one of those ancient languages, I think, is it uh, Greek or Latin? And um, uh, they actually turn out to play an important role in, in some um, areas of algebra. But uh, for our purposes, the important thing about uh, T tilde is that, well, it is important that it's monic, that its leading term is just x to the n. And it's also important that the maximum value of T tilde of n is um, 1 over 2 to the n minus 1. So that means that when n is large, this is a very small number. That means t tilde n stays very close to the uh, x-axis, right? It, it, it's a very small function. Okay, now I'll state that this optimality property as a theorem. Uh, what we can say is that of all degree n polynomials, uh, t tilde n has the smallest maximum absolute value. Right? So if you compare the uh, maximum absolute values of all n degree monic polynomials, t uh, tilde n has the smallest maximum absolute value. So in other words, uh, if you have any other monic polynomial of degree n, call it p, right, then the maximum of absolute value of p on the interval from negative 1 to 1 is definitely going to be at least as big as 1 over 2 to the n minus 1 because that is the maximum value of uh, t tilde n. Okay, so this is surprisingly easy to prove. Um, suppose, to the contrary, that p is a monic polynomial for which this is violated. In other words, suppose that p is a monic polynomial for which um, uh, the maximum absolute value of p is strictly less than 1 over 2 to the n minus 1. Okay, so here's a picture over here. The blue curve is uh, t tilde sub n, and the orange curve is this uh, um, hypothetical function p, which has a smaller uh, maximum absolute value, right? So I've drawn p so that it, it stays closer to the x-axis than t tilde n does, right? Because its uh, maximum absolute value is smaller. So now what we do is we define a new function r to be the difference between t tilde n and p, t tilde n minus p. Uh, because the absolute value of p is never greater than 1 over 2 to the n minus 1, and because t tilde n attains its maximum value at all of these distinct points, uh, we know that when t tilde n is at a, either its min or max values, p is always going to be too small to change the sign, right? So the sign of the difference, t tilde n minus p, uh, at least at these uh, n plus 1 points, uh, will be exactly the same as the sign of t tilde n. So it will be negative here, positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative, positive. Again, because uh, by assumption, p is never as big, even at its maximum values, it's never big enough to change the sign of t tilde n. Okay? However, um, if, uh, if r is going to be negative here and positive here and negative and positive, uh, right, it's going to have exactly the same sequence of signs that t, 
Tn had at those same x values, um, that means it has zeros in between, right? Whenever the sign changes, the function must have a zero if, it, if it's a continuous function. So r must have a zero in here and a zero in here and a zero in here, right? So it must have, basically, it must have the same number of zeros that Tn has, right? Or Tn tilde. Um, however, there's a problem because uh, when we subtracted t tilde n minus p, uh, both of these functions were, were assumed to be monic polynomials. That was an important um, feature here, that they're, they're monic polynomials. Their leading term uh, are, are just x to the n. That means when we subtract them, the leading terms cancel, because they're both exactly the same. And that means that r is actually of a smaller degree. It's of degree at most n minus 1. Well, a polynomial of degree n minus 1 cannot have n zeros, unless it's identically a zero. Right? So we have a contradiction here. That means, in fact, um, this is impossible. There's no way that this function p could actually take uh, a smaller maximum absolute value than t tilde n does. And so, therefore, we've, we've established that in, in this particular sense, t tilde n is optimal in the sense of having the smallest maximum absolute value on the interval from negative 1 to 1. Okay, so now finally, we can address the question of why, is, um, why are these Chebyshev polynomials so important, so useful in doing polynomial interpolation? So, first of all, let, let's assume that we're looking at a, a Chebyshev polynomial... Uh, modified of degree n plus 1, right? So t tilde sub n plus 1. And in that case, we can factor it according to its roots. So uh, it's, if it's a degree n plus 1 Chebyshev polynomial, it'll have n plus 1 roots. I'll denote them here by r0, r1 up to rn. And, um, and the thing is that because uh, t tilde sub n plus 1 is, is a monic polynomial, uh, this will be an exact equality. Normally, when you factor a polynomial according to its roots, you have to throw in a constant uh, coefficient out front. But because uh, t tilde sub n plus 1 is a uh, monic, uh, we, we don't need that coefficient, or the coefficient is 1, so that we get this exact equality. Now, this may look familiar. This looks like one of those um, psi functions that we talked about earlier. In fact, it looks like a function of the form psi n plus 1, where r0, r1 up to rn are the knots of the interpolation, right? the, the, the uh, x values of the interpolation uh, points. In that case, right, if, if these uh, roots of t, t n plus 1 were in fact the knots of the interpolation, then t tilde n plus 1 would be exactly the same thing as psi n plus 1. Right? So these two guys are equal when you choose the interpolation points according to the roots of uh, the Chebyshev polynomial. So for that reason, these are called Chebyshev knots. Right? So if you use the Chebyshev knots, then psi n plus 1 equals t tilde n plus 1. Now remember, psi n plus 1 was important because it gave us uh, uh, the error term. Right? So let's suppose that we have chosen to use the Chebyshev knots as the interpolation points, and, uh, and we're interpolating a function, let's say that's cn plus 1, right? and we're interpolating it with a degree n polynomial, so we can interpolate n plus 1 points. Uh, right? And so we, we use these points, the roots of the um, uh, Chebyshev polynomial, as the interpolation points. In that case, the error term uh, the true value of f minus the polynomial interpolation p, the error term will be of the form n plus first derivative of f evaluated at some point c uh, divided by n plus 1 factorial times psi sub n plus 1 of x. However, because of our choice of the Chebyshev knots as the interpolation points, we know that psi n plus 1 of x is the same thing as t tilde n plus 1 of x. And furthermore, we know that when we take the absolute value, t tilde n plus 1, an absolute value, is never greater than uh, 1 over 2 to the n, right? So we get a really nice uh, upper bound for the error. The, the absolute value of the error in p, right, the difference uh, between f and p 
in absolute value is never more than this um, n plus first derivative evaluated at some point c divided by 2 to the n times n factorial. Now this is a really large denominator, so this is going to be a small error. Right? We have to evaluate the derivative at some point, and uh, if we don't know what f is, there's no way to control that. But uh, uh, these uh, numbers in the denominator are large, and they're the best we can do, because as we saw, there's no way to get a smaller uh, bound on, um, uh, on a monic polynomial, right, which is what psi n plus 1 would be. It's always going to be a monic polynomial, and we saw there's no way to get a better bound on its size than we get with t tilde sub n plus 1. So this is the best error estimate you can do, which um, uh, occurs by uh, choosing the Chebyshev knots as our interpolation points. So in a sense, the Chebyshev knots are the best uh, points to use as interpolation points. However, there are two caveats to this. Um, one is that notice that this error expression here uh, involves two things we don't really have control over. One is the n plus first derivative of f, and the other is this point c, right? We don't exactly know where c is. So um, although uh, this, these coefficients are optimal in the sense that there's no uh, interpolation points that will give us better constants here, it is conceivable that for a particular function, um, f, right, for, for an individual function f, it could be that there are better interpolation points you could use. But there's really no way to know that without studying f in depth. So if you're just going to do an interpolation of a function you, you don't know too much about, then the, the, uh, the Chebyshev knots are the best points to use. One other caveat, though, is that this is only one notion of the error of a function, right? That is, we're saying that the um, uh, we're measuring the error of our approximation by looking at the maximum error at any point. Right? So we look at all the errors at all the points x on the interval from negative 1 to 1, and we look at the worst case scenario, and we take that to be uh, our measure of how bad our uh, polynomial approximates the original function. However, there are other notions of um, uh, how to measure the error of a function as a whole, of a, of an, a, a, po a polynomial as a whole in approximating a, a given function. For example, another way to do it is you could uh, take the integral of um, the error squared, right? So uh, at e every point x, there's a certain error. You square it in order to make sure that it's non-negative, and then you integrate all those non-negative squared errors to get like a total error. And that's another notion of uh, uh, the error in an approximation. And they don't necessarily give the same result. So uh, a function or a polynomial that approximates a function well in one sense may not approximate it well in the other sense. Right? So you can get slightly different notions of, of goodness by using these two diff different definitions. Okay, so let's uh, do an example. Let's use MATLAB to compute the um, uh, interpolation uh, of the sine function uh, using Chebyshev knots. Okay, so more specifically, we'll uh, look at the sine function on the interval from 0 to pi, and uh, we'll use uh, a, a degree 4 polynomial um, using the Chebyshev knots to, to form the uh, uh, interpolation. Now, because we're interested in a function that's defined on 0 to pi, whereas the Chebyshev polynomials are defined on uh, the interval from negative 1 to 1, uh, we'll make a change of variables here, right? So I'll think of um, x as being a, a, on the uh, interval from 0 to pi, and t as being on the interval from negative 1 to 1, right? So our Chebyshev polynomials will be capital T sub n of t, kind of uh, uh, on that interval. And we'll take sine x, where x is on the interval from 0 to pi. And then what we do is um, we can send x values to t values and t values to x values using these simple linear functions that simply uh, move the points right from one interval to the other. So for example, if x is 0, then 2 over pi times 0 minus 1 would be minus 1. So 0 goes to minus 1. If x is pi, then we get 2 over pi times pi is 2 minus 1 is 1, so pi goes to 1. 
So this sends the interval from 0 to pi to the uh, interval from negative 1 to 1, and this does the opposite. It goes in the opposite direction. Uh, so what we do is replace the x in sine x by this, uh, pi over 2 times t plus 1. And this defines a function f of t um, that's defined on the interval from negative 1 to 1, but it will have the same uh, shape as the sine function does on the uh, interval from 0 to pi. Right? So then what we'll do is we'll work with this function on the interval from negative 1 to 1, and we'll um, uh, uh, use the Chebyshev knots uh, there uh, to form the interpolation. And then at the very end, after we figured that out, we can then uh, undo the transform, use the opposite transform to, to return to our original interval from 0 to pi. Now, because our goal is to form um, an interpolating function of degree 4, that means we'll be able to interpolate five points, and therefore the Chebyshev knots will, will use the roots of t5 as the knots. Right? Um, so for the fifth degree, uh, Chebyshev polynomial, the zeros are at uh, pi over 10, 3 pi over 10, 5 pi over 10, 7 pi over 10, and 9 pi over 10. Right? So those are the five different zeros of T5. So I'll define them to be the A's or the angles. Right? Um, and then the X values, I'll call them the K's, will be the cosine uh, of those angles. Right? So cosine of the A's. And that gives me these X values. Notice that the X values are symmetric about zero. Right? So there's one at negative 0.95, one at positive 0.95, one at negative 0.58, one at positive 0.58. The x values are symmetric about the, um, uh, the y-axis. And then uh, now that we've got the, the x values and we've defined our function f, right? so this is our function defined in MATLAB, uh, we can then use whatever function you, you, uh, you wrote for uh, calculating uh, progressive polynomial coefficients to calculate them. Right? So in my case, I called that function polyinterp. My polynomial interpolation, and the way it worked was first I entered the x values and then I entered the y values. So replace this by whatever function, uh, whatever you called your polynomial interpolation function, and then you can calculate the coefficients of the progressive polynomial, right? So the k values and then f of the k values being the y values. Okay, so now we have the coefficients. We could just use the coefficients to graph the function, but first, let's pause and let's do some symbolic math in MATLAB. Um, so first I'm going to issue the command sims tx. That tells MATLAB to treat um, uh, the variables t and x as variables, as symbols, and not as representing numerical values. Right? So it's going to treat them as symbolic expressions. Now what I can do is I can generate the actual polynomial, see what the polynomial looks like. Um, now, the function I used uh, and wrote to evaluate progressive polynomials was called poly eval prog. You may have called it something different. And uh, the way it, mine worked was I, I, the first input was the, uh, the x values, the second input was the coefficients, and the third input was the actual um, uh, value at which you wanted to evaluate the polynomial, so the actual input value of the polynomial. What I'm going to do is I'm going to call my uh, poly eval prog function uh, with the k's and the c's, but I'm going to give it the symbol t instead of a numerical value. And it'll actually uh, spit out this um, uh, uh, entire progressive polynomial. I don't even think you can see it all here. It would be a degree, f degree 4 progressive polynomial. I don't think there was room on the screen to print all of it. Um, to make it neater, what I'll do is I'll, I'll execute the same command, but I'll preface it with expand. So the expand command tells uh, MATLAB to multiply everything out and combine like terms. And then you can see it more neatly. It looks like this. So this is what the um, uh, interpolating polynomial looks like when you write it in standard form, right? just as uh, powers of t with their coefficients. Um, now. Something to notice about this. Um, this t 
term and this term, they both have very, very small coefficients, right? This one is uh, something at uh, three times e to the minus 16th. This one is two times e to the minus 16th. These, these coefficients are very close to zero. What these really are are rounding errors. These terms shouldn't be here. Um, they only popped up because, um, you know, even MATLAB can't do everything perfectly. Uh, but in a perfect world, these terms would be absent, right? So if you ignore those, uh, those two terms with very small coefficients, you'd find that the only terms remaining are the t to the fourth term, the t squared term, and the constant term. In other words, the only terms that really matter in this polynomial are the even power terms. This should be an even uh, polynomial, right? Uh, polynomial uh, with all even degree terms. And that makes sense because uh, the function f is symmetric about the y-axis, right? This is what f would look like over here. Um, it's basically the first uh, wave of the sine function, but shifted from 0 to pi to the interval from negative 1 to 1. But it's perfectly symmetric about uh, t equals 0, right? So if you have a symmetric function like that, another word for such a function is an even function, uh, you would expect that the interpolating polynomial would be an even polynomial, would have all even terms. And that's what, in fact, always should happen. And the only reason it apparently did not happen here is a, 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 a rounding error, right? So, so these terms really shouldn't be there. This should be an even polynomial. Okay, so this is our uh, interpolating polynomial uh, for the function f on the interval from negative 1 to 1. How do we then use this to get our uh, what we actually wanted initially, which was an interpolating polynomial for sine on the interval from 0 to pi? Well, all we have to do is replace the t here by the uh, 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 equivalent expression uh, for x, right? So I'm just going to replace t by 2 over pi times x minus 1. And that way, uh, this polynomial defined when t is between negative 1 will become a polynomial that's defined when x is between uh, 0 and pi, right? A polynomial in x defined on that interval. So that's perfectly simple to do. I'm just going to use the same expression I had here. I'm simply going to replace the t by that expression, uh, pi times x over 2 minus 1, right? So that's what I did. Um, just the same expression, the same expand expression, I just replaced the t by the equivalent expression in terms of x, uh, 2x over pi minus 1. Notice that I did uh, store the result in a variable, uh, pint, looks like pint, uh, I was thinking polynomial interpolation, right? So th this is a, a symbolic expression, it's a symbolic expression in MATLAB that represents a polynomial in x. Um, and uh, you see it's a fourth degree polynomial. Now there's no reason to think that this one should be an even polynomial because the sine function is not even and there's no reason to think that the interpolating polynomial on the interval from 0 to pi would be an even polynomial, right? So this one is a, a fourth degree polynomial but it, it's not even. It, it has non-trivial first and third degree terms. Uh, so pint is a uh, symbolic expression in order to get numerical values out of it, what you have to do is you have to use the substitute function, right? So subs is a built-in function in MATLAB, and it takes three arguments. The first in input is uh, a symbolic expression. The second input is a, a symbolic sub-expression, some sub-expression inside the first expression. And the third one is a numerical value that you want to substitute in place of that second symbolic expression. So the, the, the way you can use this here is I'm going to take uh, the symbolic polynomial pint and I'm going to tell it to replace the, the variable x wherever it sees it by the values xs and I'm going to define that to be a new function p. So p is a function that simply takes the input uh, values xs and substitutes them in for x in the symbolic polynomial pint. So I'm doing that mostly for convenience, so this just gives me a, a nice simple function I can use whenever I want to evaluate this polynomial. Right? Okay, now with that done, I can then execute a plot command. So I've got a bunch of x's, you know, defined um, from 0 to pi in increments of like 0 0.01 or whatever. 
and then you can you can execute this command to plot the sine function and the uh, uh, interpolating polynomial p simultaneously on the same graph and the result you see here and you'll notice that the two curves are practically indistinguishable right you can hardly tell one is blue and one is is orange but you can hardly tell them apart here um, uh, so the interpolating polynomial has done an excellent job here right it's a fourth degree polynomial uh, is almost indistinguishable from the sine function. So I'm going to do the same example again. Um, so I'm, I'm going to do, take the same problem of uh, finding an interpolating polynomial using uh, Chebyshev knots for the sine function on the interval from 0 to pi. I'm going to do all that the same, and I'm still going to aim at getting a fourth degree interpolating polynomial. But I'm going to show you a couple places where you can uh, make improvements. Uh, both to get a better result and, and to make the, the calculation a little bit simpler. So first, remember we made the observation that um, our function f of t on the interval from negative 1 to 1 was uh, symmetric about the y-axis, right? It was actually an even function, and therefore we expected the interpolating polynomial should also be even. Um, now, think about what that means. Suppose that instead of targeting a, a fourth degree polynomial, suppose we were targeting a, a fifth degree polynomial, right? Um, suppose we, we were going to use a fifth degree interpolating polynomial on a function f that is actually an even function. Well, because f is an even function, the resulting polynomial would have to be even, and therefore the resulting polynomial would have no fifth degree term. There would be no x to the fifth term in it. There would be no x to the third term or x term either, but the important thing is there would be no x to the fifth term, and therefore actually the polynomial would really have degree four. So even if we were uh, nominally targeting a fifth degree polynomial, we'd end up with a degree four polynomial. And it's advantageous to try to interpolate uh, uh, with, with a, a target of a degree five polynomial because then we will be able to use six interpolating points, six Chebyshev knots instead of five, right? If you're nominally aiming for a fourth degree polynomial, you can only interpolate five points, but if you're nominally aiming for a fifth degree polynomial, you can actually interpolate six points. So we'd have um, greater accuracy because we have greater interpolation points. Nevertheless, there would be no cost, ultimately, because we'd still end up with a, a polynomial of degree four, right? So the polynomial would be no more complicated uh, in the end. So that's what we'll do. We'll, um, we'll use T6, or the roots of T6, as our Chebyshev knots, and we'll uh, nominally be trying to get a fifth degree polynomial, but we will end up with a fourth degree. Okay, so the Chebyshev knots for T6 they correspond to the angles pi over 12, 3 pi over 12, 5 pi over 12, 7 pi over 12, 9 pi over 12, and 11 pi over 12, right? So there's six of these um, uh, zeros, right? And they will be the angles for our x values. So the k's, or the x values, where the knots are, will be a cosine applied to all those uh, angles. So you get these points. Again, notice that these uh, are x values which are symmetric about um, the y-axis, right? They got positive 0.96 and negative 0.96 and so on. Okay, another improvement I will make is in the method. Um, remember the first time we did this, we had this rather tedious problem that we, we had to transform the sine function into the function f, right, on a different domain, and then we perform the interpolation on f and then transferred it back. Instead of doing that, let's not worry about f at all, really. Instead of uh, doing that, what we'll simply do is move the knots um, from uh, the interval from negative 1 to 1 to the interval from 0 to pi. So uh, I won't move the function, I'll just move the knots. Right? So uh, we saw that we had these knots um, uh, on the interval from negative 1 to 1. I will simply transform them using this, uh, th th this linear transformation again. So t goes to pi over 2 times t plus 1 to get an x value that's between 0 and pi. Right? Nice linear function that simply moves this interval to this interval. And I'll apply these to the uh, x values uh, 
that we that we were going to use for the knots, right? So I define this function change that takes a t value and returns pi over two times t plus one. Okay, and I apply that function to all the the k values, right? The k's, and so now I took all those um, uh, knots or the uh, x value or the t values from negative one to one, and I've transformed them to x values from zero to pi, right? So this is almost pi, and this is close to zero. Um, and now I can just do the uh, uh, polynomial interpolation uh, using these x values, right? And using simply the sine function. I don't have to use this uh, artificial function that looks like sine, but is on a different domain, right? So th th this is a, a useful simplification. So the um, coefficients we get by calling whatever your polynomial interpolation function was, right? So I, I input the x values and the y values and get the coefficients. Now I'm going to print out the um, uh, 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 what the polynomial looks like in terms of x, right? So poly eval prog, give it the, the x values, the coefficients, and I'm going to give it the symbol x for the input. So it's going to print out a symbolic um, expression representing the, the polynomial in x. Um, now, notice in this case, that the first term has a very small coefficient. The first term has a coefficient of 1.5 times e to the minus 16. So again, that seems to be a rounding error, right? Now remember, we, we predicted that if we did this, we would end up with a fourth degree polynomial. And in fact, this fifth degree term really shouldn't be there. It's a mistake, right? So if we ignore that, we do in fact have a fourth degree polynomial, right? Oops. Yeah, all this is a fourth degree polynomial. Uh, we can neglect that fifth degree term without any any substantial effect on the uh, accuracy of our uh, approximation. So uh, basically we've got a fourth degree polynomial and uh, it looks very similar to the one we got before. Let, let's just compare them a little bit. The first coefficient was here is 0 0.0368. The second one is negative 0.2311. Compare that to the one we got earlier. The first coefficient was, um, oops, uh, it was over here. There we go. The first coefficient was 0 0.0376. The second one was negative 0 0.2360. Very, very close. Um, they are slightly different, however. They, they, they can't be regarded as the same. Um, this one is a little different, and this one should be more accurate because it was based on six interpolation points instead of five. So we can expect that this one is actually the better uh, uh, approximation to the sine function. So in the first case, we were targeting um, a degree four polynomial. So uh, therefore we have to use the degree four error formula uh, for uh, polynomial interpolation, right? Now, because we were using the Chebyshev knots, we can use uh, the Ch that form of the error formula. So we have the fifth derivative of the sine function divided by the uh, uh, two to the fourth power times five factorial. And if you work it out, it comes out to be about 0 0.0005, okay? In the second case, we used six knots and uh, nominally we were targeting a polynomial of degree five. And that means we're justified in using the degree five error formula for Chebyshev knots and that means the um, sixth derivative of sine evaluated at some point c divided by two to the fifth times six factorial. Of course, the absolute value of sine is never bigger than one, so the, I just replaced the numerator by one in both of these cases. But in this case, I'm dividing by two to the fifth times six factorial, and that comes out to be about 0 0.00004. That's uh, better than an or order of magnitude improvement in the error. So. By uh, uh, making that change, um, by, by looking at six knots instead of five, we got uh, uh, an order of magnitude more accurate approximation, but it, we still had a, a basically a degree four polynomial, right? So that, that's a good trick to know. And you can apply that kind of trick also in the case when you know a function is odd or, or, or is anti-symmetric about, uh, about its center, right? Now, if you have an odd function, you expect the interpolating polynomial to be odd, and then you can use the same trick. You can target a higher degree polynomial knowing that the top uh, 
uh, highest power term will not be present, and so you can get extra accuracy at no cost in that way.